Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. Are you a new or experienced investor wanting to learn how to have a successful syndication business? Learn from the nation's leading syndication expert, my friend, Vinny Smile Chopra. He has created a multifamily academy where you will learn everything about deal analyzing to selecting emerging markets, managing assets, and much more. In the academy, you'll find over 500 lectures and templates to help you run a successful syndication business. Your membership also gives you access to Vinny every Wednesday through masterminding and coaching calls. Vinny came to the U.S. with only $7 and now is a CEO of five companies, acquiring and managing a portfolio of more than 3,500 units. He's completed 26 successful syndications ranging from 50 to 500 units and created a portfolio valued over $200 million in commercial real estate. He built the academy to teach and mentor investors like you to succeed. To learn more about the Multifamily Academy, text LEARN, L-E-A-R-N, to 474747 or call his team at 925-766-3518. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Ashley Wilson. Thanks for being on the show, Ashley. Thank you for having me. I've heard great things about Ashley before she ever got on the show, so I'm excited to, to interview her and have her uh, share her expertise on the show. And Ashley is the co-owner of How's It Look, LLC, and Bar Down Investments, LLC. How's it, how's it look flips primarily higher-end homes in the suburbs of Philadelphia. Bar Down Investment offers passive ownership to people looking to invest in large apartments and also partners with other GP teams and runs both the asset and construction management of value-add apartments. Ashley has almost 10 years of real estate investing experience, has bought and sold over $40 million in real estate, in just the past five years and has overseen almost five million dollars in renovation outside of real estate she enjoys spending time with her family and riding horses ashley thank you again for being on the show give the listeners a little more about who you are and you know i guess you know just go ahead and tell us also how you learned this side of the business of the asset management you know construction management and let's dive in absolutely well first and foremost thank you for having me on the show I started, um, I guess, the journey without even knowing I was starting it uh, with my father being a general contractor. So I grew up going to all different types of construction uh, sites, inclusive of Section 8, multifamily, multi-million dollar mansions, and everything in between. And shortly after college, I took a position with a large pharmaceutical company managing trials and that led into managing global trials. And it ultimately led into managing teams on a global capacity. So I learned very quickly how to operate from afar. And for the past five years, I ended up living, um, well, actually, two years ago, so seven years ago, uh, for five years I lived in Europe. And while living in Europe, I partnered with my father, who's a general contractor, and started How's It Look, the flipping company. So I would run everything from uh, helping set the schedules to even design, which a lot of people kind of find intriguing, but we utilize technology and leveraged FaceTime and a lot of different resources to be able for me to design the projects while living in Europe and my dad being the boots on the ground. I also did all of our accounting, our social media, uh, really anything to make my dad's job easier so he could just focus on the day-to-day -day operations of flipping these homes. Approximately a year ago, um, so we moved back from Europe two years ago this summer, um, but approximately a year ago, my husband and I decided we wanted to diversify our investment strategy and add multifamily to our portfolio. So we started um, researching multifamily actually years before that. That's how we landed on multifamily a year ago when we were trying to figure out what was the most advantageous play for our investment comfort level and our knowledge and experience. And we, we thought multifamily was the best fit for us. So approximately a year ago, 
we started having conversations with different, different people that were in that space. And we often found that people needed um, people to raise capital, which was a huge entryway into partnering with multifamily. And to be honest with you, that's neither mine nor my husband's comfort or expertise. Um, so we really needed to figure out a way how we could partner and get our foot in the door without raising capital because that is not something we wanted to focus on. And what we realized is a lot of these teams lack someone with construction experience. So the way that we first partnered on the first deal we did as a GP um, was via a construction management role. So that is definitely different than the way most people get into multifamily because most people get their taste of multifamily by raising capital and becoming part of the GP that way. Um, but for us, we were actually even able to raise capital because of that, because people saw us being very involved in the pro project and the overall day-to-day -day conduct. So they had a lot of trust in us and wanted to invest with us because they knew that we would be you know, in the day-to-day -day operations. So initially it was just supposed to be in a construction management capacity, but it snowballed into asset management. And from there, we now also have another property that I'm managing construction and asset management on, and that's a, a fair bit larger property, but also within Texas too. So, wow, a few things there. You know, it's impressive that you're in Europe and you're, you're doing all this, you're managing all these systems for uh, how, how's it look you know, in Philadelphia, right? And, and you're, you're able to develop those systems. You're able to provide lots of value, I'm sure, to your father by being able to do all that, all the designing. And I mean, that, that took some, uh, some time and some skill and, and some drive, no doubt about it. Um, but, but now, you know, it, I think it's, it's incredible too that you found a, you, you had a skill and you found a way to get into this business you know, by using your skill. And, and, you know, a lot of people struggle with, you know, how do I get started? Do I start, you know, by trying to raise capital, whatever that may be. But, you know, you had a skill and you were able to leverage that in a big way and get started. And, and like I said, I'd heard about you before, you know, before I ever had you on the show. Uh, so good stuff. So, you know, let's get into the, uh, the construction management, asset management. I'd love for you to, you know, just get us started a little bit, maybe, you know, at a higher level, what that is. And then, you know, we'll get into maybe some mistakes people make or some things we need to be thinking about, you know, uh, you know, maybe as the deal sponsor, some things that we need to go through and, and know about, you know, after, you know, after we sign or we close on a property, what, you know, what happens then? And, uh, you know, just on the asset management, construction management. Um, so, you know, get us started, kind of what that is, what those roles mean. And then, then let's go from, you know, after we close on a property or before. So before I got into the nitty gritty and, uh, you know, was in the trenches, I used to think that construction management and asset management were two independent roles that should have been fulfilled by two separate people. But now that I've now I'm now in the second project, I see that the roles can actually be combined and it can be one person managing both asset and construction management. The problem and what I have seen historically is the majority of syndication teams that I've seen don't have someone who's experienced in construction management, so they outsource that piece. Personally, I don't think that is a very a good way to run a syndication. There are a lot of reasons why, most notably is because I don't believe that your interests are, are um, aligned. Construction management fees are paid off of a percentage of the total construction cost. And if your construction cost increases, if you're an outsourced construction manager, you're happy about that because then your, your fee increases as well compared to if you are a construction manager who is a partner of the deal and a GP, the construction cost is as much as that increases, that actually takes away from your um, overall uh, valuation of the property and also to your profits, let alone all of the investor profits too. No, so, I like that. I'm glad you said that. Like the construction fees are paid off of the total construction costs. Correct. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's not an alignment of interest at all. 
Absolutely not. And I think that a lot of people miss that. And I think a lot of people are willing to give up that piece because they don't have a familiarity with construction. So I think that they think that outsourcing it to someone who's more knowledgeable about construction is the most advantageous way to go. And I think people um, get I, this might not be a well-liked comment that I'm about to say, but it's true. I think people get a little bit greedy on the GP pie and they're too afraid to give up pieces of the pie because um, they think they're giving up their profit. What they should be thinking is what is the most advantageous way to divvy up this pie to yield the greatest return. And I think it's a very short-sighted solution to outsource construction management and it's not a long-term play when you're in a long-term business when you're buying syndications especially that you know when you're doing syndications and buying large apartment buildings and you're especially doing the value add play three to five years seven year maybe ten year exits that's a marathon that's not a sprint so to me looking for these ways to shortcut the gp ownership shares it's not in your best interest because you're forgetting about the value the the power of the cap rate and the power that the noi has on the overall evaluation and i think that if people are more willing to give up a piece of the gp for partnership that exponentially will come back to everyone including the gp and the lp um, in terms of their returns at sale and i think that's something that you know, just really isn't thought through, but it comes down to basic mathematics. So for me, um, going back to your original question, when I originally started, how I thought the two were independent of each other, now that I'm in the thick of it, I realize that a construction manager needs to really understand the business side of the um, entire project and the project hold, the market demographics, what the market wants, what the market is, um, uh, what cycle they're going through, what rates they're paying, what are the current occupancy levels, what are the amenities that people want. They really need to understand that and they really need to balance the CapEx, CapEx budget that way. So if the initial plan was to put in a playground and by the time you purchase the property, playgrounds aren't the latest and greatest rage that people are seeking out when looking for an apartment in that class property, then you really be, have to be very nimble and able to pivot and able to manage that budget. But you also too have to have the wherewithal to know that. And that's why I think the two roles, if you get the right person, can be one person to execute both. No, I really like that. I, I, that's some really good stuff. I just think there's even some operators now that that don't understand the market that they're investing in, especially if it's, you know, at a distance or a market they're not familiar with and, and they're trying to be the asset manager, uh, you know, but, but I wanted to also go back. You mentioned about, uh, you know, being so worthwhile to pay this person who's an expert, uh, you know, an asset management, construction management, it makes so much sense. Can you, can you tell me like, what, is there like a going rate or a going, you know, way to, you know, so, you know, the operators that are listening, you know, and they're thinking, okay, this could be a, a team member that we need to hire you know, we need to find somebody for this role. What should I be thinking? Okay, this is, you know, what it's going to cost us. Absolutely. So I get this question a lot because we get approached a lot to partner with people. And my best answer, whether you decide to partner with us or anyone else, it's not a one size fits all answer. It really depends on your plan. Because for example, if you have a million dollar CapEx and you have a hundred units and that million dollar capex is going to renovate all of those units and provide exterior amenities that's a lot of that's a lot of work that's a lot of busy work that's a lot of estimates collecting and negotiating and follow up and you know it, it's very um work intensive where let's say for example you have a 600 unit property and you have a million dollar capex but you're just redoing the roofs and the asphalt the driveway and you're adding a playground and resurfacing a pool and maybe putting in you know a new pool liner that could easily eat up a million dollars across that size property but it's not the same level of work so you really need to understand how many projects you're doing the the type of property it is so for example if it's a class a property 
and you're just using the CapEx for fluff type work as opposed to a 1960s, 70s vintage, and you're dealing with a lot of mechanical issues, which are more challenging to deal with. So I, I definitely think there isn't you know, a, a flat rate as to what should be paid. But if you're looking for someone who is managing asset and construction management, I think you're easily going to be giving up anywhere from 20 to 35% of the GP for someone to take on that responsibility. And that's the other thing too, when you have someone kind of doing both, you can combine the fees. I've seen fee structures that collectively go up to 40 to 45% because they've broken up the two roles. And that's why I think people get turned off as to hiring a construction manager because they see this add-on fee on top of an asset manager fee and they think they can get it cheaper through outsourcing. And that's why I always say, well, you might get it cheaper initially, but in the long term, you're actually costing not only the, the rate of uh, paying that person, but the total evaluation of the property is being hit by that as well. So, you know, hiring someone like yourself, you know, or, you know, if we're looking for somebody like yourself, what, what kind of, I mean, obviously, you know, if you got, if you got experience in construction, you got experience in other types of management, you know, those are great things, but any other types of questions we should be thinking about to asking somebody like yourself to make sure they're, they're qualified for this position. I mean, cause it's a lot to say, okay, we're going to bring you into this partnership, you know, I mean, cause you're, you know, to bring you into the GP, I mean, you're, you're in this deal now for you know, the life of this deal. And so, you know, anything else that we could use to, to really make sure they're qualified to, to, to manage the construction and the asset side, you know, of this business? Well, the number one thing that you should do with any, any role that someone's going to fulfill is ask for references. So people sure. should have references on a 360 platform, not just one platform. So for example, when I say they should have references on 360, degree platform, what I mean is that you shouldn't be just asking for references of previous partners that they've worked with, but you should be asking references of partners they've worked with, the property management company they worked with, and the construction, the contractors that they've worked with before. If they can't provide you references on all three of those platforms, then I would be a little weary on what type of relationship they had with each component, because it's easy to, you know, um, make one of those groups happy at the detriment of the other two's relationship. It takes someone who is really good at what they do to be able to balance all three and keep them in harmony. Because at the end of the day, if all of those three components aren't working well, then the project is the thing that suffers. So right. that's the number one thing that I would say um, to someone to check for references to make sure. And then also too, you have to, um, ask them questions, especially if they're running asset management, they really need to understand the business. So if they don't understand the questions that you're asking in multifamily, they don't understand the terminology, they don't understand your business plan. If they're not asking you for a copy of your underwriting, just run for the hills because that to me means that they have no wherewithal to even know where to begin. They just think, okay, I'm going to be given a budget and I'm just going to execute X, Y, and Z, which to be honest with you is no different than outsourcing it because they're doing the same thing. What you really want is someone who understands all the nuances as to why you are doing something, not what you are doing. And that is the game changer in the business. Nice. So, you know, I, I think, you know, you've already provided such great information and uh, I'm grateful. And uh, so since we don't have a ton of time, I'd love to have you back and let's go through some actual just steps of, you know, like a day to day, you know, of your operations, things like that. But, but I thought we could cover, you know, just some systems and routines that you've put in place that's helped you to be a really good manager on the construction and asset side. So I am a little OCD in the sense that I like to be extremely organized and I like having trackers for absolutely everything. And I like developing tools from day one. And then I constantly modify those tools. I never consider any of my documents to be final and nor do I consider the way I'm doing something to be the correct way to do something. And I'm sure 20 years from now, I'll say the exact same thing. I like to constantly educate myself. I encourage everyone to constantly educate themselves because there's always a better way to do something. So what I do is from day one, when I started working on the first project I had, I 
I literally created multiple trackers and was trying to organize all of this information. And also too, um, I believe that the success of anything in life boils down to communication. So making sure that you have appropriate touch points with the key players that are needed to be kept in the loop. So everyone talks about communication to your LP investors, but no one really focuses on the communication within the team that is running the property. So having regular contacts with your property management company, of course, on takeover, there's going to be communication outside of that weekly call. However, you should still, no matter what, have a standing weekly call to make sure everything's on the same page and you have um, notes that are, are documenting the progression of that ownership. So for example, I take minutes at every single meeting that I do, and those minutes are shared with anyone who wants access to them. So the GP always has access to these minutes and so does our property management team. So they can reference the minutes and we do a shared screen on those weekly calls so that everyone can see exactly um, what is being typed in for the minutes while the conversations are being had. Um, so it's very crystal clear as to what action items are needed for the next steps. So as long as you continue those communications, I also have a separate uh, touch point with the GP team weekly to make sure that we're always on the same page too. And then I fill them in what has transpired across the week. So the beginning of the week is with my property management team. At the end of the week is with the rest of my partners. So we always are on the same page and things are, everyone's kept up to date. Now people can be involved as much as they want or not involved, but as long as they have access to all the information, I think that's critical. Wow. So what's the best way you found to communicate with this team? I know you mentioned Zoom. Uh, any other ways that your know, systems that you've created or come up with that said, you know, this works really well for us? We also utilize Slack. I think Slack is the hot topic right now. Everyone's utilizing Slack because of the ability for the different channels and adding people onto channels and then being able to search through Slack, go through the history of conversations. Also too, it's a really good tool to be updating pictures and sharing content that way. So I um, use that across all of my teams and across other people within multifamily that I'm having conversations with too. So it's just a very easy platform uh, to communicate as opposed to uh, text message because everyone's already within the channel, the appropriate channel. So you can, um, you know, speak to specific topics and drill it down that way, or you can have it by project. I mean, you really can, uh, it has the flexibility to be whatever you want it to be. Any, any other kinds of, of routines that really keep you on check? Like you, know, you mentioned earlier, there's so many things that you're tracking. You know, what are, what are a few things that we must be tracking? So at the beginning of takeover, you should always have a checklist of the items that you want um, to address right from takeover and the status of those items. So there are a lot of, I mean, we could probably have multiple shows on just the checklist of the items that you need to take care of at takeover. Um, but then from there, you need to make sure that your understanding of the loan terms um, and what those requirements are, if there are holdbacks that need to be you know, certain actions need to be taken by a certain amount of certain date. Um, just really um, making sure that all the information can be viewed in one location. So what I do is I create a property tracker and that tracker has multiple tabs on it. So instead of someone having to go to multiple documents, they can just go to this one tracker and that tracker has rent, for example, how much our rent was at acquisition versus what it is today. And we can see the progression there. We can see how many units are renovated, what type of renovations we, we did, because I believe in having more than one level of renovation, because I think that helps with market absorption. Uh, we can see CapEx, what the initial budgeted CapEx items were, what was budgeted, what the initial scope was, what today's scope is, because that changes as well, not only during the whole period while you're under contract, but while you own the property too. Um, just a lot of different um, different tasks that really need to be collated in one location. 
So Ashley, what's been the hardest part of the, of the management side of the asset or construction, either one, what's been the hardest part of that side of the business for you? The hardest part is when you know something needs to be done. Um, I'm a believer that you really should have multiple estimates without taking the scope of work, copying it and sending it to someone and having them just give a, a value to that scope of work. So I believe that when you have someone come out, they should not only give you their idea of the price, but the ideas to how that issue needs to be resolved. And that's taking it one step further, because if you just take the scope of work and you send it to everyone else, there, everyone's going to bid apples to apples, and that's what ideally you want. But at the same time, you actually want someone who's also very creative thinking and understanding what your business plan is for that project. So I don't need something to, I know this is horrible to say, but everyone says this in the business, whether they want to say it on a recording or not. But I'm not looking for a solution that's going to be last, you know, it's going to be there 50 years from now. I'm looking for a solution that's going to be there you know, 10 years from now or, or, or shorter period of time, right? Um, just because we don't have the capital to put solutions in for 50 plus years on these projects. So in order to do something like that, that takes time. So that can be a little frustrating to me because I like to move pretty quickly. And I like when we take over a property, you have obviously the new tenant base you want to attract, but you also don't want people leaving out the back door either. So you want to keep the um, people on the property still happy with what's going on. So you want to show them right away that you're making all these changes when you first take over a property. And it's really hard to do that initially. So that can be a little bit challenging, just getting that all organized and um, getting those been bids quickly in and executing them so you can make the transition as fast as possible. And so Ashley, what's been the number one thing that's contributed to your success? Education is the number, education. Um, The number one thing that has contributed to my success is education. Um, My grandfather, when I was very young, always said to me, there's one thing someone can never take away from you and it's your education. And he was a huge proponent for continuing to educate yourself no matter how old you are, no matter how experienced you think you are, but you continue to educate yourself because the one thing that's constant in, in this world is that everything is always changing. And um, I have taken that to heart. I read all the time. I after university, I went and got my master's full-time while working full-time. I constantly am trying to educate myself on every little nuance of the business so I can really be, um, you know, an extreme asset to anyone who wants to partner with us or even to the limited partners who want someone very well-versed on how to handle a property. Nice. Nice. And, and how do you like to give back? I like to give back actually a lot of different ways. Um, Within the real estate world, I um, co-host the Invest Her subgroup of Philadelphia. Um, So in the suburbs of Philadelphia, so it's located in Conshohocken, Pennsylvania. For any women real estate investors looking to invest or learn about any aspect of real estate, it's not um, specific to multifamily. So that's what I do on the, in the, um, real estate realm. I also am the chair of my alma mater Colgate university for my class. So I volunteer there. Um, I I don't even know how, how many hours a year, but it's a lot. So I do a lot of volunteering there. Historically, I've volunteered for a lot of charities. Um, I, I can't even tell you how many charities, but a, a ton of different charities, uh, ranging from, Um, children's organizations to um, hospitals, um, animal rescue centers, uh, really a lot of different charities. So I'm pretty diverse in how I like to give back because I feel that there are so many different uh, organizations that need our support. Um, So I'm trying to help out as much as I can 
uh, awesome. across those organizations. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that and, and tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you and learn more about your company. Absolutely. So um, with respect to our flipping company, it's howsitlook.com. And with respect to our multifamily company, it's investbardown.com. We'll have those in the show notes. And Ashley, you know, thank you so much for being on the show. I look forward to having you again. And I'd love to go thank through you. some more details of, uh, you know, just the those checklists you were talking about and details of taking over the property and things you're looking for and doing. And, and, um, but you know, I appreciate the listeners being with us today and every day. I hope you all will go to life bridge capital and also connect with me, join the Facebook group, the real estate syndication show, and we will talk to each of you tomorrow. Thank you again. Thank you for listening to the real estate syndication show brought to you by life bridge capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.